Okay, so here we are, game four, and uh, once again, an especially instructive position. Since at first sight, this one really does appear to be equal. However, one side stands much, much better than the other. So feel free to stop the video and try and evaluate the position and uh, figure out which side you'd rather be in this position. It's white to play. And resume the video once you're done and compare. you can compare your assessment with my own. So for those of you who have done that or not done that, let's now show the analysis. So in fact, white is the one who is standing much better. So what are the factors? Number one, he has a safer king. At first sight, it may appear, well, black, you know, has a whole bunch of pawns around this king and it's okay. And, you know, that's three pawns versus three pawns. And perhaps you've heard that h takes g6 is usually not a major problem because you're capturing towards the center. And those things are true. But the thing about it is that in this situation of opposite side castling, what's most significant about the h takes g6 move is that the g6 pawn now is an easy target for this white h pawn to just run up the board, play h5, and whether or not black captures that h5 pawn or allows himself to be captured in either event, the h file is going to open up and that's a serious concern. On the other hand, black is going to really struggle to get these pawns up the board and be able to crack open the position at all. So, in fact, on this basis, white has a much safer king and when you have opposite side castling, relative king safety is just such a huge factor, even more important than under normal circumstances, and also the initiative, the ability to sort of dictate the tempo of the game and create concrete threats. This is a serious factor, right? It can trump something like a material advantage. So that's the first aspect and the main one. But if we also look at the center, for instance, it's pretty close. But uh, don't be fooled by the two versus one central pawn majority here that black enjoys. Uh, he cannot really make anything of this majority since white has a lateral central pawn, which is the F pawn. And he can march that to F4 from where it'll contest the center, as well as under some circumstances threaten to advance and try and disrupt that pawn cover that black has. Additionally, the absence of an E pawn for white gives him this semi-open semi -open file that he can perhaps maneuver on and use to his advantage in some lines. And then really another very big point, piece superiority. So white has, if we look at, of course, each side has all of the heavy pieces on the board, but this is the main difference. Uh, white has a light squared bishop and black has a dark squared knight. And the bishop is going to be more effective in this kind of an open board where there's action on the queen side, there's action on the king side. For example, this bishop may wish to drop back to d3 at some point. That would be a great square for it. And from there, it can absolutely influence, you know, if we picture a bishop here, it can influence the queen side, but it can also influence the king side. And especially this diagonal, the b1 to h7 diagonal is crucial because the black king is on g8 and we know that that pawn is going to march up the board and h7 is definitely going to be a big square to watch out for black. So the superior minor piece, in terms of space, white can be said to have a little bit more space overall, but space is not really the key consideration since white's pawn pushes is not so much targeted at restricting his opponent's activity, but more so at just uh, creating a pawn storm. That said, the black knight under different circumstances, you know, if this pawn was say on g5, the black knight would love to access that f5 square, but the pawn on g4 is doing a great job of preventing that knight from coming in to a square from which it would be a very well posted and block this diagonal and, you know, influence the center, but also just in general help to resist the attack that white is going to be throwing black's way. The final point to just mention is initiative and open lines. The H file, as already said, is going to open up. That E file is potentially useful semi-open file for white, although it should be noted that for black, he has this semi-open C file, which should be more useful. So the two critical files in question, in my view, are the C file for black and the H file for white. But the H file is, you know, especially important. Okay, so how to continue here as white? Well. You don't want to play moves such as queen e2 and just be sort of overzealous in trying to get that bishop onto d3. 
because if you do so, black is going to play a6, and after bishop d3, he's going to be able to snap up that pawn on d4. And here, under these circumstances, having the pawn on g6 and not on h7 makes a big difference, since white can only play bishop takes g6, recovering the pawn, instead of, of course, if the pawn was here, bishop takes h7, and then coming in with check and collecting the queen on the next move. After bishop takes g6, material is now balanced, but queen f4, the queen uses this dark squared weakness. We can consider this to fall under structural considerations. And the white arrangement of these pawns here in the absence of an e pawn, and in given the fact that that pawn has pushed to g4, and also interacting with the minor piece distribution, the bishop on the light square can never, of course, influence those dark squares, whereas the knight can, means that black can sort of form a little bit of a defense along those dark squares, and white would like to avoid that. If you're wondering, by the way, why white would be incentivized to play moves such as queen e2 in the first place, is because black has a very concrete threat right now, which is the move a6. If it were black to play, he would just win on the spot, because after a6, the bishop cannot move to a4, and if it moves forward onto d7 after rook c7, it's going to be running out of squares. So white does want to solve that concrete problem first and foremost. White goes to move c3. And after queen a5, now he plays queen e2. So now there's no problems with d4. And this is important that the pawn doesn't fall because not only does the black queen not establish herself here on f4, but also the queen is sort of kicked away even further onto the queen side. And so white actually would be very happy if black tries to concentrate his forces against this structure and white tries to be efficient with his forces, with his bishop and with his queen and his rook and sort of Basically, what he wants to do is he wants to defend, he wants to parry Black's attacking possibilities and, and threats, but he wants to defend them with a high degree of efficiency, using as little of his peace resources as possible so that he can also use those pieces offensively against the Black King. So he wants to kind of combine this, and he's betting his money on the fact that the Black attack should come with a lot less force than the White attack. So queen goes to b6, and now here a little bit of prophylaxis. The point is that the queen is x-raying the king on b1, and so the idea is a6 on the next move, and when you, the bishop moves, rook takes c3. Now white could allow that, but once again following the principle that when you have a very, very good position or a near winning position, so there's no need to muddy the waters any more than, any more than necessary, so king a1. And here, black plays the move knight to c6. So, okay, what can we say? I think this is the last chance that black had in the position, and he should have gone queen d6. With a very similar idea, of course, without winning the d4 pawn and taking longer. But basically, you know, even if you're going this route, you want to get to that important f4 square from which the black queen can really scupper white's attacking possibilities but my opponent was uh, in this particular game is somebody who likes he's very aggressive and likes to attack himself and this would have been a recognition that the black attack is going nowhere by transferring the queen from the queen side where it can attempt to attack the white king to the king side from where it's its only goal would be to try and uh, parry white's attack if, for instance, h4, now queen f4, and black is using those dark squared weaknesses of white, and after g5, knight comes into f5, bishop d3, a6, rook d to g1, rook f8, h5, and now king f8. And this is just one sample line, but although white is certainly doing a lot better, there's no immediate win on the horizon. Black's king is going to be able to escape and then maybe be able to contest the h file, and we have a game on our hands. So... I think probably instead of h4, white should take a tempo to transfer his queen over to d2, and from there cover the f4 square, and uh, now eventually continue with his attack. But nevertheless, the insertion of these two moves, the queen to d6 and the queen to d2, should be in black's favor and give him slightly more chances to defend. Instead, black went knight to c6, and the problem with this move is that, you know, you want to attack the white king, and uh, also you want to navigate to use this semi-open c file and navigate that knight onto this very attractive outpost on c4. But the drawback of it is that after the transfer of the knight from e7, where it was at least 
somewhat influencing the king side to c4, the knight will be completely out of the action on the king side. And therefore, black is wagering that his attack is going to either crash through or force white to defend against the black threats and distract white from his goal of pursuing his own attack. And if that does not happen, then to invest a lot of time with these maneuvers, you know, it's just a disastrous investment of your time because the knight is now going to be stranded from the defense of the black king. White continues with h4, knight a5, and now bishop to d3. The white bishop is stepping back onto d3 in anticipation of the move knight to c4. Now rook moved to c6. The point is that if, for instance, knight c4, white is not going to exchange his great bishop here for the knight on c4. After all, although the black queen and knight look very scary, they're concentrating their, uh, their force on this b2 point, and White is able to hold that point. He has uh, sufficient defenders on that point. And so he's able to more or less ignore those pieces. Aesthetically speaking, the knight looks quite nice here, but it actually is performing far less important a function than this bishop on d3, which is really going to play a big role in the game. So black went rook c6, again, trying to perhaps thinking of either uh, doubling up on this semi-open file or maybe at some point transferring that rook somewhere to b6 or a6. White continues with his attack. Now, by the way, if black tries to keep things a little bit more closed with g5, then after h6, white is crashing through anyway. Probably the nicest way is bishop takes g6, f takes g6, and now h7 check. And the point is that when you move the king, whether it's to h8 or to g7, then the next move is going to be queen e5. If king h8, it's going to be checkmate on the next move after rook f6. But if king to g7, then it's also going to be a win either after the immediate queen e5 or simply promoting and then after rook takes then queen e5, right? So there's no checkmate threat because the knight is not yet on c4. And so it's game over. Okay, so after h5, g takes h5, rook takes h5. So finally, the h file has been opened, but this was always inevitable. And so assessing the position is completely hopeless. Black resigned. Let us see how things may have panned out with good play from both sides. So for instance, uh, rook to d8, g5, king f8, rook h7, queen to c7, f4, White is perfectly happy to uh, sacrifice this pawn on f4 because if black captures, then white, I mean, has many ways forward, but g6 is probably simplest. Now, if black continues to be greedy, then the move rook to f1 would just end the game on the spot. So black would need to try and keep the position somewhat closed. But after queen h5, all of the white pieces are just rushing into the black position. Rook takes g7, for instance, is a threat. King takes queen h7 check. King would have to drop back to f8, and then queen f7 would be checkmate. There's no good defense. So, for instance, knight c4 would make sense, but f5, the pawn storm continues. Remember, we had mentioned this possibility in the very beginning of uh, advancing that f pawn and trying to target either g6 or e6. Now there's no g6 pawn, but e6 can be targeted, and also f6 is a threat, creating that pawn wedge on f6, which would just give black more problems than he can solve. Queen f4, rook f1, and queen takes g5, going for that pawn and removing the possibility of that f6 idea. But unfortunately, after f takes e6, the e6 point has collapsed because black is not able to capture queen takes rook would follow and the f pawn is pinned since the king is on f8. So f7 is falling and also, for example, the threat e7 is incredibly strong. If queen takes, then rook h8 would be checkmate. So, for example, here in this position, black could resign. There are too many threats and no way to stop them. Okay, so this is the end of our, of our analysis of this particular game. I think just to offer an extremely quick review of the original position, well, at first sight, it seems material is balanced. Both kings at first sight would appear relatively safe. The two major factors, however, upon closer examination that make this position just nearly untenable for black is the fact that white has a bishop versus a knight, which in this case is a superior piece. And most of all, that given the structure here, 
white is going to be able to push h4 h5 and he is going to crack open the h file and as a result the black king is going to come under severe fire on the other hand white has an uncompromised pawn cover on the queen side and black is not able between the fact that white's pawn structure is more resistant and black is operating with the knight instead of with the bishop between these two facts the black attack simply gets nowhere white has enough resources to parry it whereas the white attack is extremely strong the opening up of the h-file is inevitable and so black needed in order to offer some resistance needed to very very quickly recognize the danger and try and get back with his queen onto f4 and exploit those somewhat weakened dark squares on the king side that white has and this would have given him some practical chances of making you know making the game continue for a long time but he instead put all his eggs in one basket went for the attack on the queen side and his attack just didn't have enough punch to it so i think this is probably the most advanced of the positions that we've examined but i, I hope you've enjoyed it well i think all of the games uh, selected have been quite instructive i hope you guys agree with this but this one in particular i think a little bit more advanced but extremely instructive yeah so okay so this brings our series on evaluation to an end to close i just want to say that the topic of evaluation is an extremely broad and difficult subject to master in fact there's no such thing as complete mastery in the same way that there's no such thing as a human who plays perfect chess after all if you had the ability to evaluate all the different possible positions then you would select the best continuation each and every time therefore this series should be viewed as simply a modest introduction to a topic that is you know at the very heart of playing strong chess one final point i would like to make is that if you have been overwhelmed by the list of factors covered, like king safety, material balance, central control, peace harmony, structure, space, initiative, open lines, as well as all the various sub-factors contained, then here's my advice. Do not panic. Instead, in order to integrate these factors into your play, what I recommend is that you focus on only a couple of these factors in the next bunch of online games you might play, or over-the-board games indeed. Then, once you become more conscious of them, you can move on to focusing on the next factors. And so after enough repetition, you will be able to regularly keep these factors in mind without a big conscious effort. The idea is that eventually, you know, you're able to sort of weigh up these factors subconsciously and indeed effortlessly, because otherwise, if you had to consciously sort of iterate through all of these factors on every decision point of a game, you would run out of time, right? I mean, you would be ridiculed for how slow you play chess, right? But the idea is that you do this, it may be tedious at first, eventually though it becomes a little bit subconscious and the results, if you stick with it, should show. Uh, the other piece of advice that I can give you in order to get better at identifying and dissecting such positions is to simply analyze your games. Use this list of factors, maybe, you know, print it off, right? I mean, write it down and print it out and have it next to you. Use this list of factors and try and relate your games during your analysis to these factors and try and see how these factors were playing out and perhaps this will help you to evaluate the different positions that you had throughout the game the key positions more accurately also by the way most teachers will advise you to not use computers to analyze your games and I i'm no exception however for certain you know limited exercises such as these they can actually be beneficial one such exercise would be to look at the computer's evaluation and when it's showing an advantage for one side, then try to understand in human terms why that might be. So, for example, if we take the original starting point here, and you're not quite sure why the computer is giving a, an advantage to white here, well, try to explain. You know, the computer will tell you what the evaluation is, but it will never tell you why the evaluation is like that. So you, as an aspiring chess player, should try and fill that gap and, and explain try and understand why the computer likes white in this position and we already know the reasons behind this specific position so that's my final piece of advice so this has been international master alex astani i hope you've enjoyed this video series on evaluation and i hope to see you in a different series in the future thank you